Is it possible to get the lights down a little bit so we can see? I'm going to force you guys to endure the darkness that my students must <laughs> whenever I'm giving an art history lecture. Uh, I want to make it as exciting as uh, seeing a movie. Is, can we do that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, how many took an art history course when they were at Cornell? Awesome. That's good. That's good. Whoa. <laughs> That's fine with me. You don't have to see me at all. At all. Let's look at some pictures. I'm gonna, today I'm going to talk to you about some pictures that um, in, the, in the exhibition at the Kroc Library and some that are not in the exhibition at the Kroc Library. I want to thank Katie Adelman Frankel for inviting me and the library for inviting me to give this talk. Oh, you can't stop it? <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Well, look, our eyes will adjust, I promise. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's, um, the, the exhibition of the Kroc Library right now is incredible because it, it brings together different kinds of travel pictures from before and after photography. Photography is only just like one way that we, that one thing that we do when we, when we travel places. And before we do, we, we could use the camera and just sort of like click, 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 click. Taking pictures or making pictures when you were traveling was really hard. Especially if you were like me and you had no idea how to draw anything. And if you tried, people were like, stick to books, you know? <laughs> or, 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 or learn to use a camera, which I did. Um, be, or you could like maybe hire somebody to make a picture for you. Or you could buy a picture of a place that was already made. But weirdly, for a lot of the history of art, most of the pictures that were made were not actually of real places. This picture is. This is a really interesting picture. It's not a photograph, even though it looks like a photograph, and I'll talk more about it later. But it has something really interesting in it, and I'm going to talk to you about this thing today. It's these people. These people. Th th this guy, specifically. What's he doing? Yeah, he's pointing. He's like, here he is in Naples, and he's like, he, he's, I, I, I don't live here, but like, you know, the, the, uh, I think this is the armory in Naples. It's amazing. It's huge. And look, look at the boat right next to it, and he's probably like talking about the contrast and all the different things that he'd always ever wanted to see. In any case, he's the traveler in this picture. He comes with, he comes with, with a companion here to go and, like, and just tour it. He's on tour. Most of the time, when we take pictures of things, this guy isn't in it. I first became like sort of like interested in this kind of in this kind of figure. This sort of like uh, as 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 uh, the curator of the show at the Croc Library described them, uh, people pointing at things. <laughs> this sort of trope in pictures. Um, or early on, especially when I was like, I was developing, I was learning to become an art historian while being a photographer at the same time and realizing that the pictures that were made in art history often look really different from the kinds of pictures that I could even make as a photographer. And I couldn't really make something like this because, you know, if I were walking around Naples or the Bay of Naples, as I actually, I actually had, the, uh, had been lucky enough to do, I've never seen people do this. I, you know, they're there pointing, but you know, they might be there. I've just never seen them. So, like, I've never been able to make that picture. And I first became aware of this. Um, in this huge picture, I was studying a photographer who made these huge um, uh, cityscapes or, or, or big, like, expansive pictures of culture. And I was wondering, I'm like, when, is, when does this guy sort of, when does this kind of picture of, like, sublime, endless culture begin? And I stumbled upon this picture, and I was like, this thing's amazing. And after, like, a few days of looking at it, I'd never seen it in person. I'd, I was only seen it in a book. And the thing, in, like, in, in person, it's like six feet wide. I noticed that there was this guy. You see him? He's standing on a boat. He's different. For everybody else in the picture is completely absorbed in what they're doing. But he's, God, he's, he stood on the boat, and he's like, wow, I can't believe how big London is. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, that's what I'm like looking at the picture. He's doing the same thing I'm doing, but he's in it. He's like me. That was the key. I was like, this is, this is the only person in this picture who's doing what I'm doing. They're like me. And I was like, I wonder how far this thing goes back. So anyway, I looked for more. You can see, oh yeah, here he is. You can see him. You know, he's small, but like, he, he's there. I finally got a chance to see this picture. It's like locked up in a castle in Prague. It like, it, it, it's been like seen in the West like once, I think, in history. Um, but in any case, so there it is. There's an, here's another one. Here's a person who's like solemnly contemplating Niagara Falls. 
Right. And like, here's, here are a couple of Native Americans who are like also contemplating Niagara Falls. All right. This is Thomas Cole in 1830. And here's the earliest one I found. This is like people who are also at Niagara Falls, but are kind of like, oh my God, and I can't wait to tell people back home in Europe about this. You know, so like this, they like clearly like, you know, they're, they're into it. They're into it. And they're like us. There's, they want, the idea about this figure is it's supposed to like teach you how to feel about the picture, right? This kind of figure, German art historians have a name. They have a name for everything. German art historians have a name for everything. And it's a very technical name for everything. They call it the Rücken figure. And the Rücken figure, which I, it's, not a, it's not a name I don't like. I mean, I think it rolls off the tongue really well, but like, but they just, it just literally means back figure. And so if there's any sort of, whenever they see a, 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 a figure in a painting or a drawing whose back is towards you, they call that the Rücken figure, Rücken figure. But like, I'm, I don't want to call it that because that doesn't really give you a sense of like what its function actually is. Its function is an avatar. And how many, I, how many of you like sort of, you know, played video games before? Yeah, okay, so, some of you. <laughs> I, grew, I grew up playing this game, right? There was, there was a, uh, with the character that you play in like very technical terms is your avatar. That's you in the world of the game. And there's a you in the world of some pictures. The, the artist Caspar David Friedrich, if you ever get a chance to see some of his, most of his works are in, uh, are in Berlin and scattered around Germany. We have a few in the United States. But some of the most interesting ones, he is the best at using this. So when like, when you have, a, this is the monk by the sea and here he is like trying to contemplate a world and a darkness and a, and a, um, and a heaven and a hell that are, that are significantly greater than him and possibly on the horizon. Here's the wanderer above the sea of fog who's like got himself all well dressed to be by himself looking over, <laughs> really well dressed. You know, this is like, this is how you rock a suit. Uh, you, you, get it, you, get to the top of, you get to the top of nature and you look out and, you know, you, you look at this, you look at, the, at nature as this thing that is absolutely, absolutely more powerful than you, more powerful than you can possibly ever imagine. And this feeling you get when you have that sense of like, it's so big you can't even think about it, that's this feeling of the sublime. And the only, and it, like, it can be a terrifying thing. It's a terrifying thing because you realize like, dude, I am nothing. Like, nature is everything, and I could just get, I, like, I could fall off this thing, I could get a blizzard that could hit me, Ever, I could be destroyed instantly by nature. So what's the worth of me? Well, the worth of you, the thing that, le the next thought that, lead, that, that leads from this, from that sort of, like, feeling of, like, oh, I'm so small and insignificant is, like, yeah, but, you know, there's something about, there's something about me that nature doesn't have. I can value things. I can make moral decisions. I can make aesthetic decisions. I can make tasteful decisions. I can become a better person. I can make the world better. These are all the things that make, that differentiates us from nature, from the nature that really doesn't have any moral, morality at all. And so when this guy can stand at the top of a mountain and look out at something so much more powerful than him, he can stand upright and proud because he brings something to the earth that it otherwise wouldn't have. And that's a moral compass, an ability to respect and appreciate things. Now, in any case, that's the way that this figure, at least the way that, that Friedrich used it, at least he used it in a very like, obviously morally uh, um, um, constructive way. So that you would not just look at this sort of like storm or the, or, or the view from the Alps and say, um, wow, cool. You would actually look at it and realize something important about yourself and learn to respect yourself and others and the rest of nature better and get in tune with its spirit. I don't know if it's the same case with The Legend of Zelda. It's, I think you just have to save the princess. <laughs> but um, in any case, the idea is the same, is that you have an avatar, somebody that's you in the picture. Now, to understand where the avatar came from and why we have it in pictures of, play, in pictures of real pl spaces and pictures of fantastical spaces sometimes too, um, we have to go back to the very beginning of the idea that you could actually have a picture that would be about you looking into a space somewhere else. And some of you have had an art history course, and maybe some of you haven't, have let, know that this, this idea came about um, at least technically, or at least it became a possibility in the 15th century, as artists learned to do something which is Leonardo described as, you know, it's, he, here's what he says, perspective is nothing else than seeing a plane behind a sheet of glass, smooth and quite transparent, on the surface of which, so it's like, on the surface of which, 
Um, all the things approach the point of the eye in a pyramid. So these pyramids are intersected. I can explain this a little bit easier than Leonardo can. <laughs> Basically, like if there's, if here's me, here's you. If you stick a plane of glass in between us, whatever, the, however the rays inter, the rays of light intersect that plane of glass in between my eye and you, that's the picture. That's what you draw. You can see that diagrammed very well here, where. I, <laughs> this is the 19th century, like engravers explaining things are the best. This is somebody dressed in a toga, looking through <laughs> some sort of weird artificial window at a cube, as you did back in, this, in like, I don't know, at some time in, in, in ancient history. Uh, even using, of course, 19th century sort of like molding and woodwork to do that. Um, in any case, that's the idea. And the idea, at least, is that you like no matter where you put the window, so long as you were able to, you know, geometrically understand where these rays are going to intersect, you'd be able to do it. Here's Albrecht Durer kind of making fun of artists who, I mean, it was a very technical thing to do this. So he's making fun of like here you have this, here you have this very, um, uh, 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 uh. And, uh, and you have this guy, and you have this guy, and the artist who's kind of like, rrr, rrr, rrr. he may as well be like programming a computer at the same time. He's like trying to do this. Um, so it's like, it's, it's a way that actually, it's, even though it sort of brought you into a more immediate relationship with the thing that was behind that pane of glass, because it was like, oh, I'm seeing it, it still was also kind of like a barrier. It kept you away from it in a, con in a contemplative place. Um, or even sort of like prevented you from interacting with it in a, in a certain way. And the story of like how that stops is the story that I'm gonna try and tell you today. Here's one way that you can think about the, bit, the transition. When artists first invented perspective, they needed the help of grids, like the grids you saw in, those, in, the, in the pictures before you, the help of the geometry. So that's why when you, when you, if you ever get a chance to see Leonardo's Last Supper, it's why it looks like Leonardo, paint, like the Last Supper was taking place like here on a stage, and Leonardo was like sitting right in the middle of the audience being like, okay, I got it, I got it. And everything sort of vanishes down to this one point perspective, and everything looks like it's taking place on a stage. Do you see what I mean about that? It's like everything, it looks like it's happening on a stage. Now that's the, that's, this is in the, in the first century of perspective. As artists got better at doing this, at drawing in perspective, and as people got, became more interested in a picture that didn't place them so far away from the action, then there's a different kind of perspective picture that gets made, or a different idea about the frame. It means that you can sort of like, once you get good enough at it and you have people that want it, here's your frame. You can just walk around and be like, no, 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 okay, no, I got it. And just sort of like lay it up here and say, that's my picture, that's it. Artists in the Renaissance couldn't do this or didn't do this because when you do that, you allow people to get up out of their seats and get right up close to the action. Now it's weird. It's, I mean, I'm, sh I, I'm as, as you know, a member of the faithful, I'm sure that there was a Last Supper somewhere at some point. But like the artists who were drawing it certainly weren't there. It was a, fa it was a fantastical scenario. And they brought themselves really, like this is Rubens in two, almost uh, 130 years later or so, getting much closer than Leonardo ever thought he would. Here's another example. Here's Paolo Uccello. You ever, if you're ever over at Oxford at the Ashmolean, this is a, a picture you should see. This is like a forest, but it still looks like it's like, the, it's like there's a grid and everything's stuck on the grid somewhere. The grid pre-exists everything, you stick everything on it. Then like, you know, 200, 400 years later, you have Edgar Degas going, he's like, well, here's, you know, here's my picture of horses. Um, and he is literally like, I've decided to just stop and put my frame right here, even if it cuts off the back of that, like cut, cuts off the front of the horse and you know, part, of this, part, part of the carriage here and everything. That's a, that picture, because of the way it cuts things off, makes things feel much more immediate. Now, interestingly, this picture is pretty, that's, it's not too long ago. It's a little over 100 years, 130 years ago or something. I'm not good at math. <laughs> um, something like that. And uh, you'll notice that like, it's easier to imagine as a photograph than something like this. 
If this were a photograph, it'd be pretty amazing. But like most of, the, most of the time, our photographs look more like this. Like their edges cut things off and stuff like that, especially if we're close. Especially if we're close. Landscape, which are the kind of pictures that you see, you're going to mostly see over in that exhibition. Landscapes didn't become, a th like of real places especially, didn't become a thing or even a genre itself until well later into this. Well, here we are in like the late 17th, approaching the late 17th century. And the landscape that you see here, this isn't even a real place. I'm sure there are definitely places that kind of look like this. But the painter, because there's Claude Lorraine, like he was, he, he would go, he lived in Rome for a while and would take various kinds of Italian castles and lakes and cattle and trees and sort of sketch them, get good at it, and then compose them in the most perfect way into a fantastical landscape. Here's, here's Jacob about to go on his voyage, right? That's, it's not a real place, but you can appreciate the landscape nonetheless as a landscape. Not real, can't take a trip there, but nonetheless, it's the picture sort of makes you go into a fantastical place a little bit anyway. It wasn't until the 17th century and then, and then more in the 18th century as people started to travel more often that you actually get finished paintings of real places or are supposed to be real places. One of the most important, picture, well, the most important artists is this, is this the one I was studying earlier for doing this, which is Canaletto. Now, Canaletto was, an, is, was a Venetian painter, started out in the theater, and then when, when like, he realized just how many British, um, uh, how many British, patri British uh, tourists were coming to Venice more and more and more as the 18th, uh, the 18th century rolled on, he and, he and another English guy realized, like, I bet we could sell them pictures of this place. And they're like, yeah. Now, Italians had been buying pictures of Venice for a long time, but the British never did. And one of the things that they realized is if they like cleaned up Venice a bit, they made it look more mechanical, the way like Newton saw the world, then like you could get people to, you could sort of like say like, hey man, you like, you, you like taking samples of nature, you like measuring stuff, right? Here's, here, you can take a piece of Venetian space from Venice back home. Just use this picture. And the British were like, great idea. So this is the first time like, you would actually go to a foreign land and buy a picture meant to be taking the way we take photographs. You know what we say, like, I took a photograph of it. It's the first time you really had a picture sold as a taken picture. Now, interestingly, even though you can imagine Canaletto walking around Venice like this, right? Good, that's another good one. The British will love that, you know? You can imagine him doing that. You know, a lot of his pictures look a lot like this. Now, it looks like, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty far away. Now, if you go to Venice, you're likely to try and take a picture like this, like you're on the gondola. There is no technical anything preventing Canaletto from jumping on one of the gondolas and making a view that looks like this. Nothing. He could do it, but he didn't. You'd be like, well, it would be such a great idea if he could because you'd be like, in it, man. And you know the British would love that. But no one really thought about doing something like that. Instead, instead, what you got was this guy. That's how you got there. That's how you traveled to Venice or to other places initially. You didn't actually get up close to the picture plane like this. Instead, artists put you in through an avatar. That's how you did it. I th I, I'm fascinated by this. There's nothing stopping them, except a kind of mentality. Because pictures of real places, this is actually, to us, it's like most of the pictures we see are of real places. We're so used to it. Photography's made us so used to it. But the idea that a real place could be valuable as a work of art, a picture of a real place could be valuable as a work, a finished painting, you should waste paint and talent on making a real place a work of art. That, wasn't, that was a radical idea. And Canaletto's pictures were derided by a lot of people as being kind of like, he's just copying what's out there. He's not adding anything to it. <laughs> well, be that as it may, 
he was doing quite a lot more than that. Um, uh, that be, can be the subject of another lecture. But in any case, this is as close to you as you got before people were like, ooh, vulgar. As the idea of like traveling and making pictures of, tr of where you came from, or where you were going, um, became uh, much more popular, especially popular among the British, who were like, we got the money, we're just an island in the, on, off, the place, off the coast of the places we should all be. Or at least to talk to Londoners who've been like, yeah, I've heard the north of our country is pretty beautiful. <laughs> I don't know. Um, th there would be like travel logs that would be published. But one of the guys who was um, really good at this is um, as an, as, uh, an artist and a writer and um, a vicar named uh, William Gilpin. And Gilpin was both a, a, a very good uh, uh, sketch, uh, very good drawer, and also very good with aqua tint. Um, and here's one of his drawings. Here he, he he toured England a whole bunch and tried to teach people how they could see the landscape of England with the same way they they would see the landscapes of Claude Lorraine, the ones that I showed you before of the fantastical picture of sort of like Jacob on his voyage. He's like, yo, you can get the same moral lessons and uplift. From the, pic from the landscapes of England that you can from the fantastical landscapes of Claude if you just learn to look at them the right way. He's like, and if you do that, you can e engage in what I call the picturesque, a way of looking at the landscape to organize your view in a way that allows you to respect it and yourself and be a, 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 become a much more like tasteful, understanding, morally, up morally upright person. Now, how do you do something like this? Well, he, believe me, he'll tell you. He's got like two, like th thousands and thousands of pages of instructions on like how to actually combine shady trees and a couple of figures in the landscape with some sublime and rough mountains and like, you know, a, a dissipating storm on the side. Now, he's basically just getting these rules from the most popular painter among the British of landscape, which is Claude and some of, the, and some of Claude's contemporaries. And people who are also writing travelogues of other places would use these principles to make pictures of wherever they went. So should you go to Iceland in 1811, here's a picture from the, uh, from the um, exhibit. Should you go to Iceland, you might find yourself in a landscape like this. But the picturesque taught the people who were drawing this to put some rough boulders first and then the avatars here and put them against like an endless sort of landscape with, with, billowing, with billowing sulfur uh, clouds coming up out of the ground. Unusual, sublime, but also like here you are, the moral compass and the moral force in the, at, the, at the center of it. There's a difference here too. And I want you to look at this different, I'm talking to you like my, my students, I want you to. Uh, you don't have to do anything I say. <laughs> You're not getting a grade. Um, <laughs> if you go to the exhibit, take a look at the difference between, these are foreground figures. They're, you look at them. The difference between those figures and these figures is this, like people pointing at things, is that these are you. These, you look with them. You, like, you enter the landscape and you step back from it and you enter it again and you step back from it, like back and forth by virtue of them. This is a little bit different. You're always looking at them as objects in the landscape but not necessarily you. That's the difference. Now, here's something very interesting. I did a little counting the other day. You know, whenever, whenever I count something, I feel like I'm like doing something that qualifies as um, research. So, <laughs> Here's some, here's some research for you. Um, this, is just, um, this is just among handmade pictures at, in the exhibition. And it's not for including photographs, okay? I was wondering, I was wondering, like, I wonder how many pictures that are handmade, again, because there are going to be no avatars in photographs. It's just, it's just not an option for photographers. Um, I wonder how many there are. And so I, I looked at some, and I realized that, like, between 1800 and 1840, there's a lot. There's a lot of avatars and a lot of foreground figures too, which are like, let's just call them like mini avatars. They're not quite you, but they help you get into the landscape. And then from 1841 to 1890, 
There are very few, just a few foreground figures. Now, what happens? What happens around 1840? The invention of photography. This is unbelievable. Here this machine comes along and allows people to snap whatever they want so long as they learn how to do it. Or at least the idea of a picture that just automatically makes itself. That you really can finally just put this here and press a button and you got the picture. Once that happens, this is one of these like, correlation is not necessarily causation, but nonetheless, um, you stop. The idea, the taste for a picture that's formed in the, pic in the style of the picturesque with the foreground figures leading into it and especially an avatar that is going to be you instead, photography kills it. That's the end. It's the end of one of the most important ways of looking at real places, the way the pictures taught us to look. Now, Gilpin, who was, Gilpin often, uh, the, he was the guy who was, who was the most important theorist and artist of the picturesque, and he was working in the late 18th century, and, and, his, and during the early part of the 19th century, his ideas were really in vogue. He, was, he would often say things like, look, sketch, the, the, uh, the picturesque is about the way the whole picture looks. Small pictures are often better because you don't, you don't spend so much time refining things. You just get it all roughly together at once. I mean, it's almost as if your mind becomes a camera obscura. He wrote this at one point, and I, I remember reading this, and I was like, you mean it's like photography? But then, he's, but then he says, but the difference between your mind being a camera obscura and doing, making pictures in the picturesque style, the difference between those things, let me actually go here. The difference between those things is that the mind, when it's making a picture using the things that it's learned about nature, not the actual things, but when it's learned from looking at thousands of oak trees as opposed to just one particular one, you get to, you get, you get to use your knowledge and your, and your morality and your taste to organize nature into a, into a form that can allow you to respect the world and yourself and other people and other beings better. If you just stand in front of something and make a picture, you're likely to get a lot of garbage. And this is something that we find one of the early photographers, Francis Frith, I, I'm sorry, misspelling there. Um, when he went to Egypt, this is not one of his pictures, um, he went to Egypt and he went to Palestine and went to other places and he was like, oh God, what pictures I could make if we could command our point of view. And he was, he was saying all the things that photographers have always said, which is like, they look at the paintings, they look at the paintings in museums and are kind of like, I just don't, I can't make that. What I can make though, is this. Here's a, this is a picture that would have made Gilpin throw up probably. Um, he got, throughout his writings, he's like, oh, this, just if you have, if you have some, like somebody holding a backhoe, or I'm sorry, a, a hoe is fine. But if they're using the hoe, that is disgusting and vulgar. You know? um, I, it sounds ridiculous, but when you, when you get into it, it's, you're like, oh, I see what you mean. Any case, this is like, is this a picture of the pyramids? Kind of. Is it a picture of the hotel in front of the pyramids? <laughs> I don't think there's a hotel there now. Um, I haven't been, how many been, is there a hotel like sitting in front of the pyramids, front of the pyramids right now? There was a few years ago. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, in any case, um, you know, one of the things that Gilpin would tell you is like, when you're making a picture of ancient ruins, don't include like a modern hotel in front of it. It's, it, there's, there's nothing you're going to learn morally from doing that. You're not going to learn to respect the pyramids better by doing that. What is the, at best, you might come up with a picture you're like, God, I wish it didn't look like that. You know, That's what photography did. But people wanted this because it did one thing. It did the thing that was always a possibility with perspective, but no one ever did it, which was actually put yourself in the space without the need for an avatar. You were finally, with photography, you, the last barrier to your actually getting to travel into the picture was there. You didn't stand back from it as somebody who's like an armchair traveler. 
At least that wasn't the idea, even if it was the reality. The idea was that you were now in it. The picture was finally about you, about your being there. It took a long time. That could have happened early on, but it didn't happen until a machine finally made it possible. This is an interesting case. You'll see this top left one in the exhibit, and the other ones are from the same series. This is, called, this is from the series called Excursion, uh, Excursion d'Aguerrien. You don't have to pronounce it so pre pretentiously, but, you can, but that's what it's called. Um, in 1840, A guy named N.P. Larabors and a bunch of other photographers went around the world with the, with the newly invented daguerreotype, which was a way of making pictures as if like on a, a highly polished piece of silver mirror. And um, it looked, when you got the picture finally, it looked like a hologram. How many of you have ever seen a daguerreotype before? It's like, why, did we, why didn't we just stop there? It's like, it's, it's so amazing. It's like looking at a hologram, you know? But one of the things that it often wasn't used for was like travel photography because there was a lot of equipment, the picture was real small, it was actually hard to see except in low light, really good for portraiture, not that good for travel. But the idea was that like finally we can go out and just capture these pictures for real. But the problem was that like publishing was really difficult. You can't publish a piece of polished silver. So you actually had to hire an engraver to be like, uh, yeah, I think I can make an engraving of that. But the problem is when you hand things off to an engraver, they don't do exactly what the picture is. They do what they know how to do and what feels right to them. Because that's, you know, you get another artist involved, they're gonna start to take over the project. So, I, no, I'm serious. So what they did is they put avatars into the pictures where there weren't any in the first place. Because it didn't look right. It just didn't look right. You know, so like, there's a photograph of Naples, a photograph from, I think that's Chartres. Here's, here's again, like, Niagara Falls. Here's uh, the Arch of Constantine. All of which now, as part of this, like, volume of, like, travel, images from, like, great monuments from around the world, these things, just to make, pe just to ease people into it. This is kind of like when they were inventing the light bulb. They could have made it a million colors, but they made it the same color as gaslight so people weren't freaking out. I'm serious, that's, that, that's, that, that's, like, that's almost a law about new technology. Is they, the te new technology could be a world of difference, but they make it look like the old thing so that you still buy it and don't think it's too weird. And that's like what was happening here. In any case, one of the things that photography was doing was killing the picturesque. Um, I just wanted to show you a few, like, just a couple of demonstrations before I end um, here. This is, uh, Gilpin really thought that like cows Great. Cows are hard to photograph if you, unless you know the cows really well, because cows are kind of like, I don't want to be next to you, so they leave. Um, but like, you know, you get close enough to them and you can stick them into a landscape. And now here's just a couple of cows. It's a nice picture of cows. Looks like a good place for the cows to sort of sit and chill for a bit. But what Gilpin would want, like thought, this is the idea of the picturesque that photography couldn't do. Gilpin drew just as like, well, the picture of the cows isn't complete without a castle in the background. Right? Because now when you see this, you can imagine sort of the cows being part of like a, almost a divine moral order that you have been privileged enough to witness. If you take the castle away, it's just a couple of cows. But if you put this, if you put the, t the, if you put the castle in, you have like a newfound respect for the thing that you're looking at, you know? There's a weird thing that happens like this. Now, <laughs> anyway, I think, you, I think you get the point. I think you get the point. There's, like, this is, there's something about like, photography and the avatar that just don't match up very well. Because when you look at a photograph, you, just, you feel like you already are there. You don't need anybody to help you get into it and to tell you to look at the thing like the photograph is already pointing at it. It's like, I don't need you to do this. In any case, it's also because like, you don't, the, the picture isn't looked at as a composition that sort of unfolds as a whole, even when it, even when it does. I took this picture of like, of, uh, of the, um, of, uh, what, you, what, you guys help me. I, I haven't been, you guys, <laughs> I haven't been at Cornell long enough. This is, the, all I know is this is, this is the, uh, this is the um, slope day slope. Um, <laughs> that's, that's as I, this is like what I stay away from, you know. This is the slope I say. I like park my, I think I parked my truck down here or something like that. In any case, 
Um, you know, when, when you take this pic, you could like take this picture as you're like leaving, you know. Um, there's like the sun is setting over there. There's like a handsome, a young, handsome tree. There's a couple, of, this is like my best tr attempt to like do a gilp in here on Cornell's campus, right? Uh, there, you, you even have like an old ruin right here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you have these guys like showing it to you and everything, right? But if they don't make any, even if they were real people, it still wouldn't make any sense. It would look like a strange picture almost, you know? It would be, it wouldn't be, a, and in any case, even if they were real, they wouldn't be people that you would be looking with. You would still be looking at them because that's the what we do with photography. That's just how we do it. All right, well, in any case, I, when you go over to the exhibition, and I, I will, I'll be over there too if you want to like walk through it and talk through it. I'll be here, Katie, Adam, and Frankel, I believe, will be here uh, at the exhibition. We can talk about some of the pictures and stuff like that if you'd like to, and like the changes that they, there's a lot of extraordinarily interesting things, especially having to do with the specific places that are, are, are depicted, which is something I didn't really talk about. And also the challenges of photographing some of them, which you'll see documented very well in the exhibition. But in any case, this is something that you might want to uh, keep in mind as you're going through as like how pictures change and how they orient us to the world differently over time. Thank you for your time.